You're listening to I Heard It on the 806, a podcast by John Bowers. In this first episode, we learn how, in spite of all the amazing things John has seen throughout his years in ministry, God has called him to live his life as a nobody. My name is John Bowers. I'm a retired school teacher, born on a farm, and had an amazing a move of God's Spirit in my life some 40 years ago when He spoke to me while I was plowing on a tractor in Oregon. And that's how we have come to create the book, I Heard It on the 806. And when God spoke to me, it changed my life. I was just a nobody then, I'm a nobody now, and I'm going to explain in more detail of why I need to continue to be a nobody. At the same time, I totally respect the somebodies, the evangelists, the pastors, the great musicians out there. I totally respect and admire all of these champions for the Lord, known by people all over the world. But the significant part of the, I heard it on the 806 podcast, is that there's millions and millions of people just like me that are nobodies, that continue to think that they can't do anything to affect the kingdom of God on this earth, because there's so many stars out there. Again, I embrace the stars, I commend the stars, but God's looking for common people also. And I believe that more can be done through nobodies than the stars, because there's literally hundreds of millions of nobodies that go to church and do basically very little, if anything, to further the kingdom of God. So I wanna start the series of these podcasts by introducing A lot of the things that the Lord spoke to me, and when I heard it, I had to first of all obey it. On the 806 that afternoon, when I was plowing and had a headset on, listening to a Christian program, evangelist came on and he said, there's somebody out there that right now is complaining about their life. You're a Christian, you're, you're born again, but you're miserable. And you're blaming God? Well, that was me because, see, I was a school teacher. I taught for three years in the Eugene, Oregon School District, loved the classroom, loved the kids, loved the faculty, loved the whole system. And my dad had a heart attack. And my two brothers called me home to go on a sabbatical for at least a year and help them on our farm. So I did. I took a sabbatical and I went home and I'm plowing in the field and I'm thinking to myself, Anybody can sit on this tractor and plow a mile down and turn around and plow a mile back. And we do that all day long. And tomorrow, guess what? We get up and we do it all over again. And yeah, I was complaining. And when I heard the evangelist say, we're going to take a break, a commercial break. And when I come back, I want you to have everything silent because I want to tell you why you're complaining. I turned the tractor off right in the middle of the field. And I'm waiting for the commercial to end. And the evangelist came back on and he said, the reason you're complaining is that you don't have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Saved, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, but powerless to do anything for God's kingdom. And man, did he hit a nerve. He was speaking to me. Now, he might have been speaking to hundreds of thousands of others, but I'm telling you, he got my attention that day. He said, the best thing for you to do is stop right now whatever you're doing and repent for allowing the Holy Spirit to be stuffed in your basement of their heart, ashamed of him, afraid to let people know that you're a born-again Christian filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's time you let him out. And right then, I fell on my knees on a dirt field in Oregon, and I cried out, Oh, God, that's me. And Holy Spirit, please forgive me. Come out. Lead me. Take me, Lord God, where you want me to go. Do what you want me to do. God, I'm here, and I trust you, Lord. Isaiah 6, 8 came to me. I wasn't studying any of this. This all just happened. And when God oftentimes speaks to you, he confirms it with his word in Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord, whom shall I send? And I said, here I am, Lord, send me. God, send me. See, I was a Sunday school teacher. I was a superintendent of of the Sunday school and and the church. I was an elder in the church, had all these positions, knew all these people, but I was empty without the Holy Spirit. And right then I said, Lord, use me, fill me. So that started this journey that caused the book to be written. I heard it on the 806. 
And the miraculous miracles of God were outlined and laid out in this book. Now, my wife and I today, when we read the book, we're not holding anybody accountable if they read the book and don't believe it, because the truth is, it's hard for us to believe. And we were there. We saw it. And I can tell you before the Lord, everything in that book, we, we did not enlarge the story. We simply told it the way it happened. And what an amazing journey it's been. What a phenomenal time it's been because God called me then into the ministry. And for 37 years, I pastored a church in Junction City, Oregon. And year after year, month after month, miracle after miracle after miracle continued to fall upon us. But we had to do something first, and that was to obey the voice of the Lord. I want to just make sure that whoever is listening understands that I'm still a nobody. I'm still a nobody that God used, and I believe that everyone listening to this can be somebody that God can take and use to further his kingdom upon this earth. I have a theme song that God gave me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. To this day, I still stand amazed. I stand amazed how he could use a nobody to touch people upon this earth in all walks of life. We've met president of a nation that called me into his office. We've met leaders in the military that allowed us to minister during Civil War times in, the, in Guatemala and lead 32,000 soldiers into the Lord. Unbelievable stuff was taking place, all because of a nobody. So I want to start today by letting you know that it's not me. I don't have any credentials whatsoever other than the Holy Spirit's credentials, other than his power. I simply get up in the morning, and when he tells me to go do something, I simply do it. Now, we've made mistakes. And in these podcasts, I'll be sharing with you some of the mistakes, because nobody bats 100%. But, oh, how I wish I would have listened. How I wish I would have been more intent in following the voice of the Lord. And we'll be talking about this later on in further podcasts. Being a nobody has been an exciting walk. Once we finished the Guatemala campaign and we had been invited by John Rivietta, first command of the Guatemalan army, invited us to take a drama and to go out to all 32 bases throughout Guatemala during Civil War time. And a phenomenal thing took place. Spirit of God brought revival and 23,000 soldiers out of the 32,000 gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. And we finished our campaign, we packed up, and we flew home to Oregon. About a month later, I got a call from Dima Shakarian's office. Dima Shakarian's secretary was on the phone, and she said, Mr. Bowers, are you the one that went to Guatemala with a, a team of high school and college kids, and did you put on a mine to 32, all 32 Army bases throughout Guatemala? I said, yes, I did. And are you the one that had permission from John Rivietta to do this? I said, yes, that's correct. And she said, are you aware that no one has ever been allowed to do this before? Great men of God have not been allowed to go in and minister to the armies of nations like this, and especially Guatemala during Civil War time. So she said, this is a story, and Dima Shikarian has asked me to set up a meeting where we'll send in our editors and our photographers, and we would like to feature you on one of our upcoming editions of our international magazine. Dima Shikarian wants to meet you then after we get all the data put together, because he wants to put your face on the front of the magazine. And in his words, he said, I'm going to make you famous, Mr. Bowers, and you'll be going in all over the world sharing the story about Guatemala, because this is a story that needs to be told. And man, did my flesh like it. And I ate it up and I bought it. And I set the time for the photographers and the writers to come. As soon as I hung up the phone, my secretary came around the corner with tears running down her face. 
She didn't have to say a word. She knew what we were about. She knew I was a nobody. She heard me share many times, keep your head down. Don't lift it up because the sword of the Lord, as it's yielded by the hand of God, it'll lop off your head if it's sticking up in a proud spirit. Keep your heads down. There's nothing wrong with being a nobody. And here I was going to be famous. I was going to be somebody. And God gave me a choice that day. Okay, then if you want to leave the ranks of nobody, being a nobody, I'll let you be famous. I'll let you travel around the world. I'll let you tell your story. But I got to go find somebody that I had in you to be a nobody. I picked the phone up. I redialed her number. She answers the phone. I said, I, I in all due respect, I need to share with you that I can't give you this story. She said, well, why can't you? He said, the, the people of the, the church and the world needs to hear this. You're going you're gonna to inspire many people. I says, well, ma'am, I'm a nobody, and I need to continue to be a nobody because I've got more assignments. And I can't tell you what those assignments are because I don't even know what they are. But I know there'll be more assignments if I keep my head down, and there won't be any assignments if I become famous. So I'm not going to issue the story. God bless you. And I hung up. As soon as I hung up that phone, the relief of God's spirit overwhelmed me. And I knew this was just the beginning. It wasn't going to end with Guatemala. It wasn't going to end with Nicaragua. It wasn't going to end with ministering to people in Harlem, ministering to the Native Americans in Oklahoma. It wasn't going to end with just this. It was going, there's going to be something greater. There's going to be something even more powerful than everything we had experienced. And sure enough, out of the blue comes Cuba. I didn't know anybody in Cuba. I didn't even know how to get to Cuba because at that time, planes weren't flying in like they, they're flying in now, even though with the COVID and everything, it's, it's made it very difficult. But I got an invite to go to Cuba. So I flew into Cuba with a couple of my elders, and we met this one pastor, Alejandro Nito. He would be considered the Billy Graham of Cuba. And I met Alejandro. What a precious, precious believer. And he asked me why I had come and what I wanted to do. And I said, I don't have any agenda. I only got on the plane because I heard the Lord tell me to go to Cuba. And so here I am. Well, he says, I have friends all over the world that come and I'm, I'm busy. I, I'm not sure if I can, can entertain you the way, be you, way you want me to. I says, I'm not looking for anybody to entertain me. I'm just here to be obedient to the word of the Lord. We got acquainted and I actually brought him and his family to Oregon and we vacationed together. And it was at that time we were sitting in Bend, Oregon at a ski slope. And he said, John, what is it? that God's called you to do. And I said, I believe God's calling us to become partners in the kingdom. He says, well, I don't need a partner. I'm busy enough. And I said, that's great. Then let's just lay it down and let's let God, because I, I can't tell you what God has designed for me yet. So we had a pastor's gathering with pastors from all over the world coming together in Bethel Gospel Church in Harlem, New York, downtown center of Harlem, was hosting the pastor's conference that year. And myself, along with 45 other pastors around the world, would gather every year just to have relationship. And it was non-denominational. We had every type of believer there. And it was wonderful as we would come together. We didn't come together to have, quote, a pastor's conference. We came together to play. We went and some of us went to the theater. Some of us went to watch the Yankees play. We were on the street. We were having a blast, always fellowshipping together. It was on that trip that we were, we were in a hotel praying about where we go next year. Where's our conference next year? Several of the group members felt that it was Lucknow, India, because we had a relationship with a phenomenal pastor in India. So I, I just assumed it was Lucknow, India. Me and the chairman of the, of the committee of the group, I said, well, guys, let's, uh, let's come together and let's hear where you believe God's speaking for us to meet next year. And there wasn't one person that spoke up. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And God says, why don't you just pray and listen to me? I said, okay, Lord, where, where would you want us to go? He said, I want you to go to Havana, Cuba. I want the conference to be in Havana, Cuba next year and proclaim it and speak it right now. So I said, well, guys, I believe I've heard God. 
And the word that I've heard is clearly that we are going to be in Havana, Cuba next year at this time having the pastor's conference. Well, there was laughter and pandemonium broke loose. Alejandro Nitro was there and Alejandro says, Pastor John, I love you, man. But he said, I believe it would be more possible for God to part the ocean from Florida to Havana than it would be to have a pastor's conference in Havana. It's not going to happen. It never has happened. John, it's not going to happen. So I have the very Billy Graham of Cuba telling everybody there it's not going to happen. Dead silence. Absolute dead silence. And God said, speak it in faith. I says, next year at this time, we will be in Havana, Cuba, having our pastor's conference. A year from that date, we were in Havana, Cuba, with 230 other leaders around the world with the pastors of Cuba. And we had a pastor's conference that was the most amazing thing that the pastors had ever experienced in Cuba. We had freedom. We had open communion. We actually had a foot washing time, which was the amazing move of God. The church jammed the big hotel conference room in Havana, the Malia Cahiba Hotel, and we had a move of God that shocked the nation of Cuba to, the, to its roots. Fidel Castro himself sanctioned that conference. After the conference was over, I lingered behind mopping up stuff when people were flying home and Alejandro met with me and he says, well, will you ever be able to forgive me? And I said, how's that? He says, well, I spoke against you. I spoke against the Lord. I watched the miracle of God. Now I want to hear what God's saying to you. What do we do next? Can we do something else? Would God do something else in Cuba? And I said, yeah, last night I was thinking about what do we do next? And I said, I believe that we're to have a gospel concert at the Karl Marx Theater. And again, he threw his head back and he laughed and he threw his arm around me and says, oh, John, you're the funniest guy I have ever met. Oh, that is, that is a kick. Oh, my. Now he says, tell me, be honest with me. Quit joking. What do you believe God would want us to do next? I said, remember in New York in that hotel when I said we were going to have the a conference in Havana? And I says, and you laughed and you said you believed it was more possible for the ocean to part from Miami to Havana than never have one? He said, yeah. I said, I'm telling you the truth. We're going to be at the Karl Marx Theater and we're going to have a gospel concert and the government's going to sanction it. Dead silent. And he said, okay. I don't know how that can ever happen but I'm trusting the Lord in you. I said, great. I made 20 trips in 14 years after that meeting, and every trip got kicked out of Fidel Castro's compound, humiliated, told me what a jerk I was. I always had my interpreter and the team with me, and all of us were told clearly that there'll never be a concert at the Karl Marx Theater. There never has been, and there never will be, and Victor, the head of all arts for 23 years, was the one that would always make the final decision. There is no way I will ever allow you to perform a gospel concert in the Karl Marx Theater. That is never going to happen. It never has happened, and it never will happen. And furthermore, get something straight. Key artists around the world have petitioned me. Every continent of the, of the world has contacted me. Key artists. Great men and women, known all over the world, have contacted me. They've offered me money. I've turned every, every one of them down for 23 years. So who do you think you are that I would allow you to come in here? Because you're an absolute nobody. And when he said it, the Holy Spirit leaped for joy. It was as if we were celebrating the victory. Because again, it was confirmed. The world sees you, John, as a nobody. Something can happen now because they've, they've acknowledged the fact that you're a nobody. Get ready. Well, I'm telling you, I got excited. But I flew home again, and I heard the Lord say to me over and over again, when the door opens, go. So Alejandro, I would email him and say, hey, go down to Fidel Castro's compound. Tell him that John Bowers wants to come back. 
He's got a different idea. And sure enough, Alejandro would text me back, yeah, they're willing to see you again. Now think about it. Fidel Castro's compound, this huge, big complex, ready to go again. Now, I never met with Fidel Castro. I, I've, I've been in his presence, but I never talked to him. I never shook his hand. I never, ever greeted him. But I was in his compound. I walked right by his office numerous times. But he always had his lays on people. And Victor was always the guy that was kind of running the show. So I went back. And again, same thing. How stupid I am. 14, uh, uh, 20 trips. 14 years. And again, I went home and waiting and waiting. And I'm saying, God, what do I do? And finally, I came to the place where I said, Lord, I'm just going to surrender if you don't mind. And he says, don't surrender. Don't surrender. You wait. I got a call. It was Alejandro's wife, Alita. And she said, I want you to come to Havana because Alejandro's dying. Now, I knew he was sick with cancer. We didn't expect it to go so fast. So I took my interpreter not to meet with the government but to go meet with Alejandro to see him. I got to his house and his nurse was there 24 hours. And he took me into his bedroom and he was just very, very, very sick. He got up out of bed best he could and he wrapped his arms around me and he says, let's make a covenant. And I says, what's your covenant? He said, I won't be here to see it. I'm going home to be with the Lord. But John, you're going to get the Karl Marx Theater, but you have to wait. Don't give up. And I heard myself speaking to my wife back in our home. I think I'm ready to throw in the towel. And right away, I picked it up again. I said, okay, God, I'll wait. I'll wait for you. And he says, make the covenant with me. So I made the covenant with him that I won't give up and we'll have the Karl Marx Theater and we'll have a gospel concert in the Karl Marx Theater and it's going to happen. Came home, and two years later, I get a call from Alita, his, his wife, Alejandro's wife. And she said, John, I think you need to come. Time's right. So I went. Well, we met a sound equipment guy that had just put a whole new sound equipment base in the Karl Marx Theater. And he knows the director of the Karl Marx. He knows Victor, who's in charge of the Karl Marx, who's, who kicked my rear end for 20 years. And they were having a big festival, an international festival of arts and music and drama and dance. And the, program, the guy that owned the sound equipment said, I believe that what I hear from Alita, that you, you've heard the Lord tell you, tell you that you're to have a concert at the Karl Marx Theater. We think this would be the time to have your concert. Would you be open to meet all the people that you need to meet? I said, well, is Victor one of them that I need to meet? And they said, he's the final one. I said, well, that's not going to happen. They said, please, let's start the process. So I took a dear friend of mine, Sean Lee, and we flew back in. And we met with the three division heads, three ladies that had to okay anybody getting into the Karl Marx Theater. All three of them were really tough, really, really tough. One of them said, we have a bar that's so high that we don't think you could even begin to touch our bar. Well, I'd had it, man. I'd, I'd had it going there and righteous anger just came out of me. And I says, man, let's get something straight. My bar is so much higher than your bar. Then when it's over, you're going to be so blown away. You're going to want us to come back. <laughs> and I know that my friend Sean probably thought I just bought the farm on that one. So we walked out and we went to the other two ladies' offices and met with them. And I mean, we were going that night to the Karl Marx Theater because they had given us complimentary tickets to a, a concert going on there. So we were on our way to the Karl Marx Theater and we were staying at the Malia Kahiba Hotel. And the instrument guy, the guy that put the sound equipment in, was taking us. His phone rings and it was Victor. And Victor said, Is, is John Bowers still there? He said, yeah, he's in the lobby. We're going to the concert. He says, well, tell John and his friend to wait. 
I'm on my way. I want to see him. So we waited in the Malia Kiba Hotel. And sure enough, here comes Victor. And we sat at the table and he looked across the table at me and he says, you're an absolute nobody. He said, do you understand that I've had all of these people in all the continents of the world wanting to come and I've turned every one of them down? Why would I take you? And I says, well, Victor, that I can't tell you other than I'm, I'm a nobody that knows somebody that will bless your people of Cuba. He puts his hands across the table and he shakes my hand and he said, it's done, it's finished. I say, hey, by the way, those three ladies, then they have to agree. He says, all three of them agreed. So the move of God happened. We put the concert on that next year. It was phenomenal. It was one of the most amazing things you'll ever see. As I speak on this microphone today, on this first podcast, Victor wants us to come back, wants us to do a bigger concert. He said, I'm going to have you come to the amphitheater and we will advertise. We'll have you at the amphitheater for at least one night and there will be 65,000 people there. I said, Victor, how could you get 65,000 people to come to the amphitheater? He says, because we'll advertise as a nation. And then when we advertise, they come. So we're getting ready to go back. COVID has stopped, blocked us for a year. And now we're waiting for things to clear up. But we will be back in Cuba for our second concert. So a nobody was used in Guatemala. A nobody was used in Cuba. But that nobody could have been somebody if he had allowed his picture to be put on the face of Dima Shikarian's International Full Gospel Businessmen's Magazine. I'm thankful today that I chose to be a nobody. You've been listening to the I Heard It on the 806 podcast with John Bowers. Make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen. To learn more about John Bowers, this podcast, and to find out how you can get a copy of his new book, I Heard It on the 806, go to IHeardItOnThe806.com. This has been an Avenue 153 production.